All right, guys, uh, thanks for tuning in to another Dead Hedgehogs podcast with me, myself, me, myself, me, Stephen Kelly, and Chris the Sledgehammer Gavigan. And tonight we are joined by Tom the Bear Om- Um He has been on the comedy circuit for, uh, in Ireland and in Edinburgh for many years. He's been on TV and uh, he's one funny and energetic guy. I done a podcast on Tom's own podcast uh, a few weeks ago, and it was like an energy shot. So I, I just had to get him on to uh, the Dead Hedgehogs uh, podcast. Tom, thanks for coming on. Hey, you're more than welcome. Delighted. Uh, an energy shot. Jesus. I mean, imagine if we did it in real life. What oh, can hell you be having? I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Can you can you imagine if we were having a few pints or maybe at, at a comedy gig? The whirlwind of absolute testosterone in the room, I'd say, would be just fucking dripping off the wall. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, I think everyone's everyone's chomping at the bit now, waiting for this second thing to end. It's almost like horses at the Grand National, fucking waiting for the tape to go up. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, I, really, I, it really is. It, yeah, it is nearly. I'm nearly at a point now where I'm like, I I won't look. Do you know that kind of way? I don't want to look to see if does if the yeah. door is open yet. I've been, I've been hurt before. Yeah, exactly. Don't fucking. <laughs> Don't even tell me when the door is open. Just fucking blow it off its hinges and just let me run yeah, out yeah, naked yeah. into yeah. society. Like, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> if I keep looking, I'll only drive myself fucking bananas. Like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a... you, you, you miss the live shows. Oh, Jesus Christ, do I what? Like, just... And every... It, it, but it swings... Like, you'd, you'd come away with a fucking mental condition, like, thinking about it. Because one day I'd be like, Ara, fuck, it is grand now. This is grand. This is the finest. But then... You'd be looking at you're there on a Saturday night watching actual telly and I'm going, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, I, you know what I mean? I should be, I should be it's her, it's pretty horrific. Like, yeah. TV, TV is fucking. It's it would you'd be melted just watching it. Like, I I yeah I I we're br- I'm brutal anyway. I lose the fucking will to live. Like, I would just even like I'm an episode into a thing and I'm going, well, right, I'm done with this because. Some fucker started crying two minutes in. As I was like, "That's it, I'm done." You know, yeah. <laughs> it's just I, I just, I'm old now too, and I can't deal with that shit. Like, Pro- probably the only good thing to come out of television is um, the Tommy Tiernan show in over the lockdown. I think it's it's probably the best t- television RT have produced in a long time. I think the but, Tommy uh, Tiernan show is kind of evolved, and he's it's almost like he's gotten better with it. Like. The longer the longer oh, they went like, on, yeah, he's, yeah, just, yeah. He, he's just gone more and more out of it. And people are people have kind of picked up on that. Like, well, it's like anything when it you know, people kind of forget that it was a brand, it's a brand new medium for everybody, the style he's doing. But anybody, like, no matter people just accept or just expect that because he's well known, he'll be brilliant at it. He fucking yeah. wouldn't. Yeah. He'd be kind yeah. of rough at fucking block lane or plastering too if he took it up in the morning. But yeah. give him a of couple, course. give him 30 or 40 attempts at it and he'll, pa- you know, it'll be good. Like, you know, yes, so of course. it's, but he will get that time in the ball because he's Tommy Tiernan. And also 90% of the guests are desperately intimidated by him because he's one of the funniest people the country has ever produced. So they're always on the back foot. Yes. So Tiernan can just lean in over you and he can go for those long pauses and the camera, I tell you who, I, I met one of the guys, he's head of photography or uh, director of photography on that. And he's a fucking genius. He, Tommy Tiernan owes that man a, got a lot of money because the time <laughs> he leaves that camera on him, whereas another fellow would be like, come on, fucking move it on, move it on, back to your man's face. No, yes. he'll leave a good 15, 20 seconds of awkwardness on Tiernan's face as he's rubbing himself. Go, 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 dream. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's all the money shots. And he, I tell you, it's fantastically produced too. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did, do you know what? The, it's something that's almost leaned to being more intimate without a crowd. It's actually got, I think that there's something it, about it without a, a crowd. It's a fucking yeah. podcast as well. Exactly that's, what you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. that's exactly what I thought. I, I thought so too. It's, it's just like a, pod, a live podcast or... It's 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 like a podcast that um, is on television. But again, I I can't even watch that. Right? I can't because I'm looking at that. And he reminds me of stand up comedy, and then I'm going, "Ah, fuck off, Tommy." You know what I mean? I'm just, going, <laughs> yeah. just just getting back to the energy thing. We 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 as the three bucks left, and it's the same thing. We tried it a couple of different ways. Um, what we do now is my uh, Mikey Sam goes out first. Then I'll go out and then Pete goes out. And we have little acts in between. 
um, maybe you local com comedians or someone to open up for us or whatever. We, we like using local comedians or even even musicians. And and Mikey starts off and he's that deadpan, you know, uh, comedy. Yeah. And everyone loves him no matter what he does. Then I go out and it's, it, it gives it loads of energy. And then Pete comes out and he just, again, blows, blows it up again. But it's it has to be a continuous building of energy. If you go out there and you literally... Just blow the beans straight away. Yeah, it's it's yeah. nearly it's nearly like it's going to go downhill after that. Yeah, you're going to have to build it back up again after. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and 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 it was it was, and in that particular one because it was it was a long show he was doing. He wanted to do a bit of time immediately after me, rather than actually having a break, which is the norm. Like, yeah, you would yeah. you would have a break and let everybody go on away, have a drink, and either go, wish to fuck that the head that the main act would come out and thanks for the jizz, your man's over, or Fucking hell, he wasn't bad, one or the other, but at least it lets people's brains cool off, go for a fag, go for a drink, back in. Now, here comes the boss man. And that's the way it works. But yeah. it kind, it, because it was, he wanted to fit a lot of material in, he was jumping on immediately after me. And sure, it wasn't. I was playing yeah. a headliner set, and yet he was coming in doing a long show. Headline. Well, he was yeah. doing a long show, so it didn't really... The two, the two, the never the twain should meet really like a fucking headliner's hard 25, 30 minutes will never it, it just does it's two different sports literally yeah, it's two yeah. different sports one is one is the fucking the ten thousand one the other one is you know the 400 meter fucking hurdles you know so the two don't line up even though you're both runners do you know what i mean like yeah yeah, yeah yeah in that particular genre but yeah i took it as a massive compliment but i've got yeah it's been great i've gotten to tour with a couple of brilliant brilliant acts like uh so tom um, how, how many years were you uh, touring before you got to open up for for Tommy, uh, I'd say I was probably five years. I'd say at that stage, I'd imagine. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably five years. Um, it's still a fast progression when you when it, you take the like. Obviously, Tommy Ternan is heralded as probably the greatest in in or one of the greatest de of Ireland ever to do it. You know, definitely. I'd say but, even in the world, uh, he would be. Yeah, just, yeah. He's I mean, just, nobody, he, yeah, there'd be nobody to hold the candle. Like, if it turns on a lineup anywhere, yeah, uh, maybe yeah. America, because that is its own thing, you know what I mean? Yes. But it's a completely different stratosphere, like, in, or diff, just a different fucking planet. Yeah, it's just a different game style. over there. Like. But if, if he's on anywhere in the world, he ain't going on first, I can tell you that much. Like, you know what I mean? He's, <laughs> if, he's, if he's on a lineup of, you know, the, the best of the best, like, it'll be Tommy Tiernan will be closing the show, like. Yeah, or if he wants, he'll go on in the middle if it's quite late or whatever. But he'll he'll be picking where he goes, you know, that kind yes. of way. He picks what yeah, yeah. It's that and that's and that's what you earn when you're 28, 29, 30 years in the game. Like you, that's that's what you earn. And keeping it that fresh and that hot every time. Like so but yeah, I suppose well, yeah, relatively quick. You, you, it, it's I I suppose it's it goes way weird for everybody because you look at some people that are in the game, like, and you're going, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, literally last week you were, you decided to take this up and three weeks later you're filling Vicar Street yeah. based on a lot of, it's, you know, so it, it's, it can kind of go, I, mine went the most normal way in that I didn't get a jump up from anything, but I just gigged the second I, the second, I had nothing else on, to be honest with you, the boom, had the arse had fallen out of the buildings. <laughs> I decided the bit of, I was doing, you know, the work I was doing, I fucking hated it. I fucking hated it. What, what, were, you do, what were you doing before? Well, I was, I was a civil engineer for years. Right. And then, uh, which I liked. And then the arse fell out of everything. And I ended up working for an insurance loss adjusting firm going out to like, you know, buildings that had fucking burnt down and stuff. And you're trying to, I was just, it wasn't that it demoralizing. Was, and it wasn't the, the job itself was all right. It was the people I was working with. I just, you're all terrible people. It was just, every one of them were terrible. <laughs> I just had never met such back, you know, backbiting. And I'd never, yeah. you know, and, and I knew the day I'd start, I'd start to do a stand up. And I was going, oh, fuck this. I've neither chick nor child. Will I just give this a go, go, like it's a job? Because yeah. fuck it. And uh, I knew my days when the day I was done was, your man, this little rat of a boss that I had wrote me an email. And he, his office 10 foot away from me. Like He wrote me an email bollocking me out of it. Like, but hanging me out to dry to a load of other people on a fucking subject that he actually was to blame for. But because I didn't have any, because I didn't have the, the the wherewithal or the maturity to know to hang on to every piece of info and all the rest. He basically greased, hung me out to fucking dry and he wrote it in red. I went, 
are you fucking joking me an email so i went to knock on his office because i was going nose to nose with this fucker there's no way you're gonna i need the door locked i went all right lad he leave it locked good luck <laughs> and he's, I'll see i just can't because I said, I'm, I'm gonna end up doing time for murder money anyway like because so i may as well just get out while the going is good and i did i went i went as hard as a paid professional would go at it doing the open mic scene in the Ireland and the UK. I did it as everywhere and anywhere and every weird shithole. What, what, age, what age What age? you at this stage? I was 27. 27. Okay. So I was late, late to stand up for a lot of things, but at least I had a, I suppose I had a lot of working experience. So yeah, when I, when you, if you end up in like hosting roles and stuff like that, which a lot of comedy clubs tended to, that's what progressed me my my actual I suppose my standard I suppose came on when lads would go hey, fucking your man knows how to talk would you host our you know on a, you know host a club on a tw- Saturday night or something and that would then give you loads of because then you're ad libbing and you're yeah. working with the audiences and what it was is that I'd actually worked with a lot of people and I knew what people's jobs were because you're seeing lads going up twenty one and they did arts in college. And if, you know, they wouldn't know a job if they got a kick in the hole from it. Like, you know, so they're, <laughs> you know, and these lads are going up and going, uh, so tell me, what do you do? I'm a quantity surveyor. Oh, <laughs> tell me your favorite quantity. And they're going, oh, Lord, I love it. Fuck. Lord above. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, and people are just, and people go, oh, this is grand, but, and, and, but there's next to no ability to deal with the scenario. Like, you know what I mean? Because yeah. they have no idea who they're talking to. But I, that was what I had on my site. Other than that, I didn't know, you know, I wasn't trendy or anything like that, but it was, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, so it just went at it like a bull at a china shop and it was all right. on for the first year or two. Like there was not a bean coming in, nothing like, do you know, it was, it was where, just, where did you start? Where did you start? Can you remember your first, your first gig? I can. Yeah, I can. I was tricked into it and it was actually the one and only, maybe one of two nice people that work for that company. I remember telling this girl, she, this woman that she was there, she was a lovely, lovely woman. She's, I remember telling her the story because she was having a just, every day was hell day in this place because everything was just, there was poor misfortunes had their house burnt down. Then you have a boss who's trying to fucking, uh, just, uh, uh, just terrible, terrible place. And she was having an <laughs> awful day. At and I remember just, I says, I'm going to tell, I, I said, wait and I'll tell you about, and it was just a silly made up story about this fella I met down the shop that I didn't meet at all. Like, but, just told this long story and because it just grew legs and grew and it just, de- I developed this crazy bastard I met down the shop telling her the story. She laughed so hard, she burst a blood vessel in her nose. Was, <laughs> yeah. The so she, her nose just started pissing blood. Pissing blood. So <laughs> we took, like, literally wouldn't stop for nothing. So we took, for a finish, we had to take her up to the hospital and she had to get it cauterized. It was down in Cork, I was at the time. And on the way, we were driving back down to the offices and uh, she says, man, you have to be telling shit like that on stage. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. And she took that as a yeah. And it was like, there was a handful of small comedy clubs. Now, there's only the one really in Cork now, but there was a handful of small ones dotted around the city. And she just rang around from Facebook to see where, and I didn't know, but about two weeks later, she says, hey, we're, me and some of the guys from work are going for a drink. I says, well, you know, I'm not drinking with any econs. And she goes, ah, no, no, it'll just be me and my husband, and my sister, really. That we're sound. I said, oh, Grant, Grant, fine. I'll go meet you for a drink in this obscure bar on McCurtain Street that I'd never had been to. And I walked in and she was, oh, we're just down the back. Yes, Grant, Grant, walked down the back. And it was a comedy club down there in this the coolest little room. It was like, it looked, it, if hipsters put her together, you go, you lads, you've tried too hard. It was that cool. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it yeah, genuinely okay. was. Most of the shit came out of skips, old bits of corrugated iron nailed onto the wall and, you know, old chairs that you knew were knocking around this long, you know, and it, it was cool. It was called the crack house. And a, a late great friend of mine, Billy Anderson, was in there and he came up to me. He says, oh, you must be Tom. And I started fucking shit in the bed because I'd never been in the comedy club or any performance of any sort before. Bar when I was very small, did some plays and stuff. And he says, uh, Caroline tells me you want to do some time I went are you fucking joking me no no Christ no he went no no don't worry I won't put you to your pinion collar think about it and come back in seven weeks and have seven minutes have a minute to put together for seven weeks I went oh fine yeah get grand yeah no bother yeah whatever and just but had such a good night got drunk and everything I said this is the job the following night brought all my mates in I'm sure he was delighted I brought about 20 of the lads in filled the fucking club out and went a couple <laughs> I got so langers right that night we had a great night that I remember Sunday morning, him ringing me going, he was American, Billy was. 
and he rang me and he says, how do I spell, um, how do I spell Omahani correctly? So I said, what? Why would you want to know that? And I inside the bed with a hangover. And I answered, <laughs> I told him, I hung up and then thought no more of it until the following morning. I was down the spar getting an old breakfast roll and on the way to, to, to the job and uh, I see my name on a fucking poster in Passage West in Cork. Because he said, sure, look, but you, were in, you were in Saturday night, you agreed that you were going to do it. Next Friday night in the soccer club, there was going to be comedy and you were on the bill. You're doing five, five to seven minutes. You're on it. You said you would. I said, Billy, I was out of my fucking bin. I would have said yes. <laughs> I would have said yes to, like, literally, I was having such a good time. Going, yeah, fucking. And it was, but it was, it was, it was, it was it's not our but shut up, isn't it? It's just that yeah. week. I was just stressing out of my head because, and I had nobody around me that was involved in this entire, you know, this arts and theater, nothing. I had nobody. All my friends were construction based and all like the handful of boys who I told about were going, why are you fucking doing this? This is the worst mistake of all our lives because this now I'm stressed. Out. Boys were stressed. <laughs> I'm associated with this. <laughs> yeah, but the boys were all hard men like, but this was fucking jizz now. You can't be. And I went, look, fuck it. And I had spent a long period of thinking about, just if I ever gave it a go, I wonder what because I'd been I watched comedy on telly and I knew that it only lasted a certain amount of, and he gave me the challenge got the head down and like that week was shitting it a handful of friends came and yeah thankfully I was on a lineup of pure shy comedians it was great <laughs> <laughs> everyone at the lads is brutal and there was a lad who went on before me some Scottish fella and Lord save us uh, he got like he was he he had the ability ability to have very dark thoughts but he did not have the ability to stitch any humor into him do you know what I mean so he just <laughs> and what was weird was like there was a lot of the soccer club owl ones were there who didn't even know this was coming on like they were just sitting there drinking their sherry on a Saturday in, in the clubhouse like and <laughs> this shower of fucks get up but it did I, I had three bits if I remember correctly I had three bits that all lasted about two minutes and um, they went well. Yeah, it actually went well. You know, it was rough as shit, like, but it yeah. went well. But immediately I was like, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the drug kicked in then, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Were you nervous? Were you nervous going on for your first time? Oh, I nearly pissed my pants, cowboy. Like, I'm not joking with you. Like, I was at, and like, I'd, I'd done, like, martial arts from the age of four all the way through. I was 24. Like, I'd done MMA. I'd play, you know, I'd, I'd, I roared at fucking grown men, 250 men on one side that I was running, and it was another 300 another that I was running. I didn't, I didn't bat an eyelid at going nose to nose with a fella in a scrap like, and I said, nothing. But this, for some reason, this was so outside my comfort zone. Something broke in my brain that night that I, I think everybody should try and break once, like, because yeah. Yeah. Something, something snapped in my brain that a whole other part of my brain opened up. Like, so what the fuck is this? And then once I broke that duck, then all of a sudden the heroin got into the veins and I just, that was it. I, I it that job. It's, it's, it's fight or flight at that stage. Um, and then w- once, once you get on it, once you get in a rhythm, it, there's no better feeling than, than owning the crowd or, or walking the stage and, and getting reactions. Um, it's, it is a beautiful drug. Oh, it's like, and it was, it was that night. And but immediately I went, that wasn't good. That wasn't good enough. If it was good, it laughed. Uh, people laughed, but in my own head, and like, it got a little, there was a guy actually, amazingly, there was a guy there from a newspaper and he actually wrote, thanks be to God, the open mic at least showed up be- because the rest would have just fucking, the locals would have burnt the place down with something along because your man, the open mic, Tom, was actually had some semblance of comedy in him. <laughs> the others yeah. were just, um, <laughs> which I, I kind of took as a compliment, but I went, no, no, what I want to be reading is that your man tore the fucking roof off this. And that's yes. where I need to be. And I, I very quickly realized when I, I ended up, you know, doing a couple of comedy clips and you're going, oh, oh, that's a person who's been doing this 10 years hard. You're, oh, you're really slick. You, you don't yeah. waste a single word. And that was where immediately I wasn't going, right, sure, look, we'll keep tipping away so and see where it's going. No, immediately I was into... Uh, you know, I was in, into boot camp in my head. I went, this has to get, okay. every gig must get better. Every gig must get better. I must get better. But like, I'm, I can't, I need to get to a point where there isn't a wasted fucking syllable, let alone yes. words. Everything and, yeah, needs yeah. to be per- it, it, perfect. To, to be great, isn't that the, like, that's the art of comedy, that every syllable has to have certain amount of meaning. And if it's, you're cutting the fat all the time off of it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's any any new comedians that are ever starting and they ask me, do you know, if they, and they do oh, the odd time, they will ask me, have you any advice? And I just go, listen, you have to, whether you like it or not, you have to record your own gigs and watch it back and you have to watch it critically. You can't go, can I smash that there? Watch it critically. And what I do too is I would download Audacity and I'd put your, your sound wave on it and try and find the word ah. The amount of times you go ah or um, and write it down, and you will have a meltdown. How many times you say it in ten minutes? I know, I know. I try, I try, I try in in day to day life. I I I, I try and be conscious of of how many times you say ha or am, yeah. you know. And yeah. do you know what? It's one of these things that you you for a certain amount of time you'll get rid of it, and then suddenly it creeps back in, like fucking crabs or something. And then, and, then you're yeah, back yeah. and then you go, oh, shit, I got rid of that before. I'll have to get rid of it again. And it, it's this constant battle going back and forth. I mean, it could, like in normal conversation, it, you know, it's absolutely accepted because it's our brains blanket out. You don't hear. Yeah. The, and they're little jumping off points. But you're not having a normal conversation when you're performing to people who have paid to see you. Do you know what I mean? You're yeah. not having yes. it. Even though they'll go away going, geez, just like going for a pint with him. It wasn't. No lunatic would go for a pint with a fella that's going to stand up on the counter and talk down to you. Do you know what I mean? For an hour <laughs> where you don't get one word in. You know what I mean? It's, you didn't, <laughs> we have not gone for a pint. Trust me. I've just made it feel like that. And that's taken 12 years of bust me old to make. And you know what I mean? And obviously at that point, you I do. I am enjoying what I'm doing. So there is a coziness to it. Like, but... It is yeah. very much a professional performance, like. And yeah. over over the course of the last year, year and a half, almost a year and a half now of this crack, how, how have you found being creative and trying to harness that creativity at the moment? Yeah, I suppose the, given that that's where I started off from, a pure shit place, like, um, if it all came handy to me, I'd be like anything. I you'd be shitting your pants. I wouldn't know what to do with myself. Do you know? I mean, you'd be yeah. running, but. Because it didn't come handy at all and probably had to elbow my way into a lot of situations where I wasn't getting invited, the same thing had to apply to this scenario. Like, we go, well, now I step up the podcasts and now they have to get better. Like, you know what I mean? This is the only yeah. creator, other than fucking going 5.4.9 kilometers and shouting in everybody's window. Do you know, I don't know, <laughs> what, else I could, I don't know what else I could do. Like, you know, um, and I, I've done some online stuff, but mostly hosting up corporates, events and stuff like that, because I tried the stand up thing and I, I knew it. I said, this medium cannot work at all. Like it can't unless we do it yeah. conversationally back and forth. You know what I mean? Unless yeah, the host yeah. is there, the crowd are watching and we do a bit of a, a set up, you know, banter back and forth. That's the only way this is going to work, because you need to be in the room with people. You just have to be in the room with people. Yeah, 100 uh, percent. We, we The only the only live uh, little thing that we've done. We've done live, we went on Instagram lives and YouTube lives, but that's different. You're, you're interacting with people that are typing in and, and watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We might be watching again, but the only thing we done, we were asked to, when myself and Pete done the run and Chris was organizing, what Chris was like managing everything that was going on outside the run, we were doing the run and Chris was organizing the actual, the, the, the logistics of it. But um, we got a, the, physiotherapist that um, takes care of male, male football team and he's also managing the Brafey team which has like say Aiden O'Shea and the O'Shea's and that he, he, he said would you return a favour and do a bit of a show for the Brafey lads on, on screen and we did it and it was great it was great fun but because it was because these were local lads and we sort of knew them right. we knew their names and we kept it short it was like 12 minutes in and out and we just kept basically we just kept taking the piss out of each each one of them um but it still just wasn't the same and, and i can only imagine trying to do it in front of like 50 strangers and screens it just it just you know and then someone might get up uh, you know you're always caught in, in your eye as well if someone got up and walked out in the room ah, maybe stop. just maybe just it, go it, to the toilet but it's it, still it's, it's, it's like it's yeah it's brutal but the only thing is and i kind of hate it um <laughs> What I've noticed I'm doing, I've done a lot now at this stage, but what I've noticed is people are becoming better audience members. Zoom has become part of our life now. So people have actually okay. more, it's integrated into people's lives more that 
people are far better audience members than they were, say, a year and a half ago, where people were going, hot, you know, and they were, sh- you know, shouting, <laughs> to, you yeah, know, yeah, didn't yeah. know where they were or what they were doing. Half lads were coming from underneath a desk or something, they didn't know. But now people are sitting front and proper, they have behind them tidied up, it's gas, like, and and they, they are looking into their television as if it's a stage. And I kind of hate that, that that's where we've, but it, it, it's it's the natural phenomenon that has happened as a result of this. If people who desperately love the interaction of stage and theatre, they'll go, well, this is the best I've got. This is the best I can do. So this is what we're going yeah. to do. And they've become very good, but I don't want them. I don't want to spoil those lovely people. I don't want to ruin them. I want to just go, no, go on into a box and come out brilliant again when we yeah. come back. You know, but yeah, yeah. it needs must. And, and comedy clubs still need to run Dude. and shows need to run and stuff. They say, they say the most the most addictive thing in, in the world is to to a human being is another human being. We need it's a natural just mm. longing or want. Oh, I, I would absolutely go one. I mean, I've never tried heroin, but I would say, yeah, on top of it, yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> for me, for me, it absolutely is like there is no when people were asking me, they couldn't grasp, like, literally, uh, when we had a lift during the lockdown last year, I think it went to level two or three or whatever the fuck it went to, and I, we were able to get out, and there was uh, every gig, this is what inspired us, with uh, our move out of out of the Greater Dublin area, because I did about 14 gigs in the space of about a month, which would be small numbers for normal, like, but I did, a, and but they were everywhere but Dublin, they were Cork, Limerick, mostly Belfast or North of Ireland. It was just, the North of Ireland was flying it like. Mm. But people were going, Jesus, you went up and down to Belfast two days. I went, I would drive to America to do a stand-up. Mm. Are you joking me? Literally, I don't give a bollocks. I'll ram the coffee into me just to get there to do half an hour, 20 minutes. Give it to me. Yeah. That's how yeah. Yeah. all the other stuff just falls by the waste. But the effort goes into it, which is if that starts to become effort is what I'm worried about when we do go back. Will that become effort? Because I've become a fat lazy bastard here where that's no, my biggest no, fear no. is getting well, is getting mentally chubby that's my biggest fear they, i can't they, see i can't see that happening tom but do you think people will will be get lazy and not go to the gigs or do you think there's going to be and that, and same question for you chris do you think people people will will like as soon as things open they'll, they'll flock or will they be a little bit wary I don't know. I mean, talking with friends who were in Belfast at the weekend, Belfast was buzzing. Now, there was no great shows on, but people, there was apparently a lovely buzz around the town, like, you know what I mean? Because they have, you know, bars are fucking outdoor drinking and stuff now, and it's 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 a bit, it's getting a bit looser. So, I'm praying to Christ that you're, that the, the people won't be terrified to go out, but I don't know what we're going, I pray to Christ they won't, but there's something deep down going, I don't know, will this Will we get back to what it was? I don't think ever. I don't think it'll go back to exactly how it was. I think there definitely now an avenue has opened for more online stuff, and I think venues will be mad not to sell tickets online, even while hosting a live thing. Which I remember, I was maybe four years ago. I remember being in London. I remember two lads. They were lit. They were the most. They were those really excitable, like early 20 year olds who had great ideas. You know, when you meet those lads, and yeah. at first you want to go, oh, fucking relax there now, boss. Will you? <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> life There's exactly, too much coming at me right now. <laughs> you, your, your positivity is upsetting me now at the minute. Like, yeah. But they were, just, <laughs> you know, they were, they had no wrinkle on them, the bastards. They were two good looking whores, and they were going, they were, you know, they were like, mate, that was fucking amazing. What we were thinking was, why not, why are we just selling tickets in the solid room? Why not sell them to the virtual world? And I was going, Errol lad should I wouldn't fuck would watch stand up. You know, who would watch stand up now from fucking their sitting room when they could come down and see it? And we're like, no, nah, mate, no, no, no. There's definitely a market for them. Like, oh, not nobody's going to want to be entertained on a Saturday night at home on their telly for stuff that's happening in the real world. They want to see old shite that doesn't remind them that the, there's a pub there. And they went, no, nah, mate, no, nah, I'm telling you, it's worth it. There's enough people and we market it right. And I went, look at it. Yeah, look, there's my email anyway. To, and we talked back and forth, but the lads were kind of, they were nice fellas, they had great ideas, but that's all they had. They were just a couple of fucking flutes, as it turned out to be. But I was kind of glad <laughs> because I didn't see it going anywhere. <laughs> I saw, who would want to be watching stuff online? Sure. What are you talking about, lads? But it's, well, I, I'd say it was the same when they started doing Live with the Apollo. You know, and like you'd see these, obviously the comedy's been, uh, it's been recorded for a long time, years and years. But like, Live at the, the Apollo on this on this Saturday night just became a thing for 
for people for, you know, watching Frankie Boyle or watching whoever that was hosted yeah. that week. And then you just start looking at it that the Zoom um, comedy shows have kind of taken that approach, only no one's in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose yeah. and that was that was what my my argument to them lads was yes there is the likes of the Apollo there but it's on a grand theatrical scale you know you would never feel it looks like, cool yeah it yeah, looks yeah. cool but at the same time you don't go jeez I'd, I'd love to be down there now you don't like you, you're happy yes. to watch it as a big show you watch a small comedy club where there's 50 people there and they're all clinking drinks you go fuck it I want to be there do and you know, know what when you're there <laughs> it actually sounds la- loud but yeah. when you're listening to it back on because you know because you record all your comedy set it doesn't sound half as loud as when you're <laughs> in the room, in the moment yourself. <laughs> so you're yeah. like, "Fuck!" It's all got massive laugh there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 the thing is, the thing with the thing is with live as well. You can see people's expressions. Your your expressions are picked up more. Like the camera can't pick up just that little delay, that that little wink, that twinkle in your eye that that is is in a live. You know that little bit of, you know that 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 d- deliberate five second delay before you before you drop the punchline you can feel the energy in the room oh and, and i th- and i think it sharpens your performance as well absolutely i i mean there's a handful of things that uh i was very lucky i i, I did a play last year the year before Jesus, last year the year before and i couldn't believe how much it had working with a professional uh it was a one-man play and i'd done some stuff before like professional pantos and stuff or typically the one in limerick that i do i play myself i don't sing or dance i just kind of wander on as tom um but all these people are all, like ultimate professionals every one of them have all trained in rad or they're trained in you know bird college and dancing and they're all tours the world like one of the lads had just come back from doing cats in hong kong like you know they were so watching these people are going Fucking hell, look how they carry themselves now do you know what i mean all the extracurricular stuff that they do to make sure that when they hit the stage, their face is beaming into the fucking rosette up the back. Do you know what I mean? Think, things like yeah. that, you're going, do you know, and that's, we go, oh, well, you don't have to do that. Every advantage you can gain, get, get yes. it. Like, and watching, you know, it's with steamers after the shows, just to make sure their voice is like velvet the next day. Do you know, think minding themselves. So watching, and then when I ended up doing this play, well, it's 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 not my. No, I was able to abbreviate it for. I was able to modify it for Irish audiences, but it's a play called "Defending the Caveman," and it runs continuously in Vegas, and it runs still in New York. And I think it's the, it's the longest running play in, in Broadway history, um, one man play. But it's done. It still runs in parts of Europe, but they want to do an Irish tour. But working with this this um this director, now they allowed me to. It came as a two hour play, and it the reading of it was just all American. I went, Jesus Christ, lads, what world of this? They went, no, 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 this is what we do. The lads in Mexico have a different one than you. You know what I mean? So take the guts of it and then we'll get it passed by the fellow who owns the play, who's a chap in San Francisco. Once he okays it, then she's your to go. So an awful lot of things were personable to me, you know, in the play, but working with the director, Dan uh, Gordon is his name. Dan has been, he's done it all in the theatre world. And the things he was able to teach me of this, how you close off your shoulder ever so slightly and then you open it back up. And we're talking, this is martial arts stuff in yeah. theater acting. Find your light, find your favorite light, find, you know what I mean? And then you you open up on certain words and it gives you this, and then you do create a melancholy on other words by closing off your body and then turning sideways to the stage at certain points. And you do that like I did, we did what, 28 nights of it around the country in different theaters. And just jumping from that then straight back into stand up. Sure, my stand up had turned into, Oh, Phantom of the Opera it had gone up but I noticed it was becoming effortless now not effortless but effortless to get a huge reaction out of people I was going what? Yeah. what's after happening here and it was my wife pointed out she went Jesus Christ you went down like Phantom of the Opera there like you like kicked the fucking gates off and ran in because it was just it, because it was another and that's why I'm saying is find every advantage that can gain you an advantage. Go fucking take a dance class. You know what I mean? Take a Shakespearean class because all this stuff for real world theater, which I hope we do get back to, which you will, what I'm, my roundabout long-winded fucking point was, is that <laughs> no you will, that will never translate across Zoom. You know what I mean? Yes. I know the can. chap that's doing Russell Carl Kelly. It's a one-man show at the minute, Russell Carl Kelly. I think it's uh, Paul Howard's play. Um, it, 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 it will, yes, they will probably have a five camera setup. 
and they'll try and get as much of it and they'll probably be shot brilliantly but it still will not be the same as being in the theatre with it you know that kind of way and it yeah. is being I think they are selling tickets to people um, through theatres around the place but it's still it won't even come within an asses roar of the real thing like to see it in the, in the live performance but the, the, even with the, the live performances like being something about comedy is that when you're all packed in tightly together and you're all like the laugh carries throughout the room mm. because it's infectious and all of that kind of plays a part so even the shows when they reopened some of the gigs when they were keeping a, a social distance between people it must have been so hard to manage and manage some of that stuff as well the only thing I'll say, yeah, it was a, it was very different. And I remember we were over, it, I was, Jesus, the sadness of it. I was in Galway for the very first gig in the country that opened up during level, just the summer last year. I mean, I'll never forget, I was driving across the Midlands and just 28 degrees. And I said, this Jesus, Mary and Joseph, God himself is in the car with me here. 28 degrees. And I'm about to do an open air gig in Salt Hill. Well, fuck me sideways. I'd pay to do this. And over we went and I was rusty. I was very rusty. And I, I actually had to point out the elephant in the non-room and go, well, fuck me. I thought I was good at this. And in fairness, the audience are like, no worry. <laughs> we're rusty as shit too. We'd just be left out of the house. So we were all kind of in it together. And I was like, ah, grand. And then turn around a month later and I did the very last gig in the country, which was back in Galway, but it was back in the Russian Dove. And, I, and but the, we kind of grown used to the fact that there was a table, be, you know, there was a bit of yeah. space between people. Uh, but we were kind of people nearly made themselves a bit bigger to fill out the space. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it was. Yeah. But honest to God, if there was only two people in a horse box in the middle of a field, I'd still take it. Like you know what I mean? I don't. It yeah. still was phenomenally further down the line than I, doing something virtually. I, you know what I mean? I seen I seen one of your tweets uh, that said or, or or comments you said that you you can nearly take a gig in the Cecil Hotel. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which is very, it was very, it was perfect time. It was fucking true though. I damn near would take it. Yeah, but that's that, what that's, is what is what has been your 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 favorite gig? Yeah, and then tell me what any weird or worst gigs. Oh Jesus, I don't know about my favorite. Like there's been, it's it's a. Uh, the Roisin Dove typically in Galway, Galway full stop, the west of Ireland full stop. I blend in very well with those people. Um, we're on a similar plane of fucking wildness. Like there's, I think we've tried to talk about that. I don't know what it is. There's, there's fucking wild wiriness. There's, there's, there's something Celtic mythology. I don't know what it is, but we kind of get under each other's skin. And before you know, we're all kind of mentally impregnated with each other. Like, to, to <laughs> like that last gig I did in Galway that night, that was, it's probably emotionally, emotionally, that was probably one of, if emotions go zero to 10, it was probably on a fucking 12 because we all knew we were all getting locked away again. Do you know, because say level five was coming, truth be told, by the time I got in the car, I sh it was half 11. I had to be at home by 12 o'clock because it was coming in, but tried to cross, I had to cross the country. So, but regardless yeah. of that, like, yeah. but um, yeah. I remember, oh, I was to do, I think I was to do fucking 30, 35 minutes as the headliner. But Joe Caulfield, who was the Zoom gig it was joe's i mean she's huge but she was zooming in from edinburgh her zoom shit the bed five minutes in when tom could you go over it longer i said longer stop put on the fucking tea because i'm not going anywhere <laughs> <laughs> and out i went and i did an, I, something like an hour and 15 or an hour and 20 minutes like we're talking just i don't want to go home and nobody in the room wanted to go home nobody in the audience wanted to go home and it was a sad moment it was like I suppose I'll put this mic back in this fucking mic stand and say goodnight to everybody, will I? And people were like, ah, oh, Jesus oh, Christ. Yeah. The heart was fucking being pulled out of me at this stage. I was just, like I said, rusty as fuck it's all till 14 gigs later, we were back on the horse and it was fucking beautiful. And we were after doing an hour and 20 minutes together or whatever it was. And all of a sudden they're going, now go back into your house, you bollocks. Get yeah, back into your yeah. house and don't come out again for another fucking six months. And you're like, oh, Six God. months, more, maybe more. More, you know what I mean? No, nobody knew at yeah. the time, you know. Yeah. yeah but it was yeah. just that moment of melancholy where it was like, this is bittersweet. I just had a class, uh, intimate, fun gig with 
the kind of people that I love. People who think, like, you know, they think like me. Like they, there's nobody, there's nobody hypersensitive in the room in any way. Everybody's <laughs> clued into the moment. You know what I mean? And we're all in the one plane. Then all of a sudden. I look down at the owner. He's like, "Fucking, we gotta, we gotta do, we gotta, you know, we gotta fucking." I'm gonna, Jesus Christ, my stand, my stand. Um, but there's been some banging ones, like banging ones, like you know, full house to the opera house down in Cork. You know what I mean? Like just mental, mental gigs. I remember opening for Tom Stade in a t- we toured in, and Stade is like the he is the last action hero. Like he is the last rock and roll comedian. Like he's. I remember him ringing me at fucking five in the morning as I was about to fly over, go go to the airport and fly over to him where he lives in Edinburgh. And he says, uh, yo, Tommy, now we barely knew each other. He just had liked my style down one night in Port Leash and out of nowhere, he just rang me and said, you want to open for me for five nights in the UK? I was like, yeah, grand. He rings me at five in the morning going, so I'm heading to the, uh, to the off license in the morning. I just want to know what beer you like. I went, Tom, it's five, like, you know what I mean? To be, five, <laughs> and you knew you were on and we did the stand and then we did the following night, we did this huge warehouse that becomes a, a club by um, just basically this events company take it over it used to be a tractor factory it's an old it's got still the big fucking winches running on the ceiling 500 people and the pyrotechnics they, like it's ridiculous it's like fucking gladiators in the 90 like it was wow. mental coming on stage <laughs> And I didn't know, like, they were an unbelievably receptive audience, but also they'd put my name and my Twitter handle up behind me. So I, it was only just, I, like, literally I walked off stage and brought him on. I'm like, why is my phone blown up? Because people, especially you're in the UK, nobody's going to be able to spell O'Mahony handy. Well, fuck me, I had about oh, 700 followers. As we're, <laughs> so it was like, how oh, did this? Oh, yeah, all right. It's been written up there. All right. <laughs> uh, speaking, then, speaking of the UK, go on. Yeah, go on, sorry. I, I know weird ones, and weird ones... Uh, Jesus Christ. There's myself and Jerry McBride. He's a writer with, the, he's a stand-up as well, but he's a writer with Water for Whispers. We have a, a show called The Tom and Jerry Show. And we have, we have a bit in it called Worst Gig Ever. And like, just going back through these memories that I'd crammed down. <laughs> in, it's like, oh my God, I actually did that. And like, the worst gigs are always in places where there was never meant to be comedy in the first place. It is a club or a theatre or something, you know what I mean? It, it'll normally be there or thereabouts because people are going, oh, sure, this is a thing. Like, But if you're mm-hmm. on a pallet, you know, in a pub that mostly, you know, yes. drink, you know, where jockeys mostly drink or something like that, where they're all angry little bastards and they're all watching, <laughs> this, they're all watching the snooker and then all of a sudden they go... <clears> the <throat> lad's talking in the corner. <laughs> uh, this, this, uh, this lad is going to come up and do some jokes. And you're like, oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, right? Okay, you know. And that's, <laughs> and, but that's, I did that for years, just going, yeah, so I know you don't want to fucking talk to me and I'm not fucking putting that, I'm after cutting. And I remember one night, I took a pen out of my pocket and cut the sock, cut the plug off the fucking telly. I went, no, shut up to fuck. I'm going to do I, I don't want to be here either. You don't want me to be here, but we're going to fucking see. It was down to Tremor in Waterford. Nobody wanted to be there. And we all, we all did about 45 minutes together, me and all these lads with no teeth. It's like the others. Um, but yeah, there's, there's just been a, a plethora of mental ones where I remember getting duped one night. I was doing I was back in that old club, the crack house. And but Anne-Marie Lewis was the lady's name who actually, I remember she had the most ridiculous laugh. Lovely, lovely woman. But she just come down to headline the show. For me. I said, lovely. I said, but listen, I have an extra one for you. She says, when you come down to Cork, a little earlier in the evening, a little outside the city in Douglas, uh, there's another gig that I'd love you to do 10, 15 minutes, get paid. It'd be great. You'll double up. Jesus, this all sounds great. Great. I'm thinking I know Douglas well, like, but I don't know of any venue that would have, I can't. And I land on, there was a part of Douglas I'd never seen. It was no, like, it was an old little parochial hall style thing. I said, what's going on in here? And I to see by the chuckly head and they're going, come on, no, 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 come on. You're about to go on now. Yeah, you should be on in about five minutes. And I walk in and it was the AGM of the ICA. Just the fucking Irish Country Women's Association. <laughs> <laughs> and just their, just their variety night. And literally I walk in and go, what the fuck? What do you want me to do with these people? Like, with the blue wrist? <laughs> like, I've got dick jokes. That's it. I've got dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and getting drunk and, you know, wanking. What, what am I... What am I going to do here? Because you'll be fine. They're a gas bunch of bitches. And I'm saying nothing with cardigans here, Anne-Marie. I don't think and my wife, girlfriend at the time was, 
she said it was possibly one of the best moments of her life because her just her my head was just like a beetroot just standing there going well I don't know and she her head was beetroot because she was roaring laughing so hard there was a <laughs> there was a lad on stage there was a duo a father and daughter on stage playing the spoons and oh, they I got a fucking amazing round of applause and, <laughs> <laughs> and even if you like the slightest thing will help you and an MC can help you so well it's phenomenally well in a, such a scenario a good MC at the time or somebody who knew what they, what was happening would go no this is an absolute uh, change of direction this guy is going to be a bit different than the last he's a comedian so strap in might be a bit rude, might not. He'll be grand. We'll all have a good time together. Relax, girls. Kind of, you know, I know, yeah. you know, whatever it takes just to smooth them up a bit. Now, this fella comes out and he's like, <clears throat> well, uh, so, I mean, how good was that, right? Huh? Spoons. Well, <laughs> and then his face just dropped and he looks and went, but sure now for the next while, until the next act, uh, we're going to have a fella do some jokes. So, uh, Tony, is it? No, Tom. Uh, Tom, Tom, Tom. <laughs> like, oh, fuck right off. And I went up. And, <laughs> all I said, look, I, it's going to come down to one or two things, girls. Either I take my clothes off or we, we just all strap in for 10 minutes and I tell some jokes. Like, And it was funny. There was a family of banjo players that were to go on next. And I'm like eight minutes in dying in my hole. And even I started laughing. I went, this is so fucking bad, isn't it? This is not what I'm here for at all. Like, you do not want me here. We are not on the same plane. And they were kind of chuckling too. Going, they were going, yeah, we have no interest in seeing anything you have to say for yourself. Because, <laughs> you know, there was, we had this honest mutual thing like on. We're yeah. not meant to be to get look. You can, We're not supposed to hang out here, like yeah, yeah. No, and you just sometimes can't force people together, and that's fine. That's great. And that was what was hilarious was I could see the young fella, the banjo playing family. He was about six, but he was like he, he was like if he was smoking a fag, it wouldn't have looked weird. He was one of them young <laughs> who looks yeah, like yeah. he's been on the road forever and he's seen it all, right? Yeah, yeah. wearing and an he, iron jumper. He's only six, <laughs> and he's looking at me with a, as much of a look like. I'm off to fuck there, lad. I'll start that. Out. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I went, I was, look at fucking Luke Kelly over here. Come on up, Luke. Come on, what? Come on. <laughs> I said, because your man did me no favors. I said, and bringing me on. I said, I said, I'm going to be nice to you. I said, and bring you on. I said, what's your name? And he was like, and he still kind of looked at me like, going, I don't need your fucking help. I've got a banjo and I'm awesome. Get the fuck. So I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, that was, honestly, that's, that is one of, 350 um, horror shows that <laughs> but the, it's getting to the point where you you that doesn't crush you because you know you can go and fucking rip it in the, where it's supposed to be not or you can point yeah. out like I, I remember having a mental breakdown at a carpet gig one night where I just I'd been working we had a, at the time I said my wife had a, had a shop and it was Christmas and it was a, a toy shop and I hadn't slept in like three days and I had this gig over in Dunboyne Castle and there was a duo, a musical duo who were very good friends, uh, totally wired. And the lads wanted to do this. Now, the, what was It was a company of people who didn't like each other, which was hilarious. There was like eight tables and you could see it got, the, from the people who earned a lot of money all the way down to people who didn't earn a lot of money in this pharmaceutical company. And none of them fucking wanted to be there at all. Like and <laughs> The lads went, look, We'll go up. For some reason, they wanted to do 25 minutes and then bring me on. They'd soften up, bring me on. I do 20 tops. And then the lads would finish it out with all their songs after that. The lads went up and died so bad for like eight minutes. They went, now, welcome to the stage, Tom O'Manny. <laughs> and, I, and I'm on the line with a point in my hand going, what? Uh, what? So I, I went up and these people were just, they were just not, they just, souls were gone. There was no soul. The company was not a nice company to work for, clearly. And like a typ typical it. salesperson. They just hated each other. They are, yeah. And I just, I just snapped. I just snapped and I didn't go shouting or anything. I just sat on the edge of the stage. And it was, I mean, I'll never forget, it was, it was a cordless mic, a radio mic. And I just went, look, I don't give one fuck about any. <laughs> and you don't give a fuck about me, but I and I can also see what's even worse is that none of you give a fuck about each other. But you're looking. <laughs> I'm locking the fucking door down here because I'm still getting paid to do this shit. And I'm either gonna spend the next half an hour telling some jokes and you're gonna enjoy them, or I'm gonna go around the table and get real fucking intimate and dark with some of your fucking secrets in front of everybody. Which are we gonna do, lads? We have a bit of crack. And you can see kind of somebody go. Uh, 
They <laughs> 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 all just started clapping. I went, and I, I kind of stood back up. Well, it wasn't part of the act. That was a genuine fucking threat. But I'll take it. As <laughs> you could see people, they were looking at me going, that man is a true artist. He is broken in front of us already. And he may actually kill us. He may come off the stage and kill us. And it was, oh, yeah, there's fucking... The darkness kind of can come over you every so often. But I think we're, it ended up being so, an all right gig. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you just have to, you know, when, when you've nothing to lose. Sometimes, when you when you get to a stage on on stage where it's, it's like fuck it, no matter what happens now, you it can't get any worse. I think, I think some of them can turn out to be brilliant, brilliant gigs. Then you know, you oh, just yeah, go, yeah, go yeah. in with 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 you, you have nothing to lose attitude and i think that sometimes brings out the best you know you you've nothing nothing you say um no holds barred you know yeah you, you I, done you done you done edinburgh yeah a couple of times yeah, yeah edinburgh a yeah, few times yeah yeah cuz that cuz that is the highlight of of any comedian's would be one of the highlights of any comedian's career I suppose it is. It isn't. It isn't. I mean, it's de- it is definitely necessary to do it. It's um, it's a rite of passage, is what it is. Now you go in at two levels. You either go in at you know the free fringe, or there's kind of three levels to it. So you go in free fringe, just trying it out, first couple of years, and then you see lads who are lifers. You know what I mean? They go over there every year. They had their. They know exactly, and it's still free technically, but people pay as they you know as they go out as an appreciation, and they have fans coming to it. And then there is the ticketed one, and this is for lads who. This is the, you know, they could, I think a lot of merit is put on it. Um, that's not to do it down or do it dis, a disservice. A lot of merit is put into it because once upon a time, Edinburgh could make or break you. You know, where agents would yeah. come, they'd see you. It, TV agents would see you. Now, would they see you? Not fucking really. Like, because the agencies here at home would have to be pushing you. So they say, my pony is running. Like the chances of, actually being out there and some agent randomly walking in the door and going to your show when there's 2,000 other shows in the city. Not really. But I'll tell you what it does do is it makes you fucking bulletproof because you do your own show. So you do, whether you do a half an hour show splitting up with somebody else early doors or whatever you do, a 20 minute show splitting up with two other people early doors, but you typically get an hour slot in whatever venue to be in quick, get yourself set up quick and be gone quick because there's another fella or a girl in, after you in the same place. But you'll do that 25 nights in a row and it, to mm-hmm. promote your show lads run compilation nights all over that's where lads make a proper few pounds like it's running compilation nights because they're putting you know they just host it and anybody any low any comedians who are in the vicinity can come do 10 good minutes and flyer people as the exit and that's that's how you get paid is that you you do an expo in front of people now it's saying okay. that all those people put four or five pounds in the bucket too and your man who's running the show he gets so it's a smart thing to do but by the time I remember the first Edinburgh I did I came home and I mean at that stage you're probably only doing a gig a week at best yeah at best you're a gig a week because nobody knows you nobody gives a shit but you come back from doing I think I did something close 63 times you know so we won't call it six I did 26 shows of my own hour long show and then another 30 odd compilation shows so by the time mm-hmm. you've seen, you crammed in, you know, almost six months, a year's worth of quick gigging into one month. By the time you come back, you've jumped so far forward. You go back into the clubs that you had been playing just beforehand. You're like, oh, I'm not stuttering over fucking words here. I'm not wondering where the next sentence is coming from. This is like a well-oiled machine. And that's that's what I, I would suggest to people. If you ever do it, have a ton of work is, lined up immediately afterwards. Is it a confidence thing? After doing Edinburgh or, or the likes of that, is it a confidence thing that you now know that you, you're sharpened up and you're confident enough you can walk onto a gate and everything is free flow? Your words are coming out, you're not stuttering, you're not amming, you're not and you're you're turning yourself when you should be turning and you're hit, hitting the absolutely hitting the, yeah. the jokes. Yeah. It is. You come back bulletproof, you come back like a completely different act. You know, you really, really do. You come back, and what lads typically do is they'll write a kind of a rough show. It'll be relatively rough. They let you know they'll they'll preview it a couple of times here, we'll say, and then yeah. they take it to Edinburgh and they do twenty six or twenty four, whatever they end up doing, twenty four shows, we'll say, and it's polished, polished. And the idea being is that you have this perfect nugget of a show. You've taken out all the the waffle that isn't needed. And you put back in bits because sometimes bits just arrive in your brain and during that because your brain is popping for a full yeah. month. Your yeah. brain is popping. You you're useless at everything else, but you're just brilliant at comedy. Because your brain is just going, Jesus, look at that crow with one leg. He's fucking gas. Let's talk about him. Do you know, it, it, everything <laughs> gets plugged in. 
But what you normally see then is lads have a tour lined up after that. So, you know, like the likes of Delamere and Tommy and stuff, they would often do Edinburgh to just polish the hell out of it because yeah. they're going, this won't make me the big bucks, but when I come back home and I'm doing four or 500 seaters four nights of the week and I have this immaculate show, that's what it's, that's what other people yeah. use it for, you know? But Yeah, uh, yeah the li- the likes of Foil Hog and Arms have done that a lot over the last couple of years. They they immediately tore after doing their stint at, yeah. um, at, at Edinburgh. Like I suppose it's one of those things, as you said, it's a rite of passage, but it's it's a very it's almost like a tool as well. Because as you said, 24, 25 days in a row. If you're if you're home, you know exactly what's gonna work, what's not gonna work. And even if it works on one night out of five, it's not good enough. Yeah, and I mean the idea too is that even if you're you're dying on your hole, you're like, Well, I've died my hole a bunch of times already. You know, the fear of dying on your hole is kind of gone, which people subconsciously don't really know why you're good a lot of the time they go hey, why is that fella so fucking good and yeah. it's because people like to feel like you're in control they don't want mm-hmm. to turn up at the guard station and the guard going i don't know what to do with this <laughs> <laughs> you want to go in and you want to meet a figure of authority who will go mrs sit down there i will handle this whole thing it's the same with a performance they don't want to go in and hope that they have to fucking help you along with it yeah, almost never happens. You know what I mean? They want to go in and go, I want to shut my brain off and not think about mortgages, not think about the fact that I'm overweight. I don't want to think about any of that. I want you to shut all that off there now with your funnies. You talk to me funny for the next hour, please. And that's what people want, even though they may yeah. not be outwardly thinking it. That's what they fucking want if they've bought a ticket. So if you're in there and yeah. you're kind of going, oh, sure, where are we going? What are we doing? You know, that exactly. Of- and, and people are on your side. People are going yeah. to a comedy gig not to run you down. They're there to be entertained. They're there to be with you and to laugh with you. It is so rare. It is rare you'd get it. And you'd get it a bit in the UK. And the odd time you'd get it in, play- again, places where comedy wouldn't typically be where lads go, just, you know, the lads. Local yeah, yeah, yeah. Lids. Yeah. They'll, yeah, yeah. they'll try and go and they'll, you know, the same lads who are standing in the same spot in the same pub for the last fucking 20 years. Like, the, uh, now I'm very, very few times you'll come across this, but they will. They'll go, I'll fucking, I'll show you what a funny cunt is. And, you know, they'll buy a ticket to try and it. And sure, I mean, you're going, lad, you're just talking to these fuckos for 20 years. Yes. Guess what I'm about to do to you? I'm about to virtually fucking rape you in front of your fucking neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> You and they're all going to applaud me after. Yeah, and they're going to... Do you know what's even worse? They're going to fucking pay me well yeah. to do it. Yeah, yeah. that's even worse. <laughs> okay, that, I, we have a friend called Dan Riley, and he is a perfect example of being one of those lads that wants to fucking take down the comedian going up on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just, he's, he's just, and he can't help himself. He's just a big, noisy fucking kettle yeah, a yeah. Like, you know, and a lot of time it's not it's not initially out of a bad place you know unless you're a complete and utter psychopath it's not oh, it's <laughs> just like i think this would be gas do you think this would be gas sure let's say it and what's what's worse is when it doesn't it does they do it to somebody who's not who's not able to take it who's new enough to comedy or maybe it's just yeah, you know okay. and you're going shut up your you know but what's beautiful is when you see them absolutely being like uh, one of the gigs was in Limerick during the and it was yeah there was three, it was one a very strange time it was in Limerick one of the during the lift I was in a new club it was in Jerry Flannery's bar the rugby players bar and this gorgeous venue where people were it didn't feel like people were spread out too much actually it was a gorgeous venue but there was this gang of fucking blokes who must have read the first page on what going to a comedy club is about heckle you know, because it was the night yeah. in their head, it's still the 1970s. Even though some of these lads, they were clearly all working together and they'd given shit to the opening act, they'd given shit to the host. And I'd said it, I, you know, it was either between me or Joe Rooney, but we were going to close. And we, Joe had closed, or I'd closed the previous one, he was on in this one. So I, I turned to the, oh, to the manager and I said, So you going to shut these lads up? Are you going to shut? The, he goes, No, sure, that'd be a bit awkward. But if I, I mean, no, it's a, well, made your fucking awkwardness. Go down and shut him the fuck up. There's another 90 people in this room who hate him. Because was well, that not part of a comedy club thing where it is the manager where lads just fucking to be shouting hell. shit? Yeah. I said, Does anything, them take cunts, anything they've said sound like it's going to benefit anybody in the room, including the comedians. He went, It's a valid point, but I don't know, Tom. Some of them are regulars. I said, I'm only saying this to you because when I get up there, I'm so ven- venomous right now. I said, when I get up there, 
I'm going to absolutely spank the whole. I'm going to pull all their trousers down in front of the whole room. I'm going to bum them all. I'm going to do it. <laughs> everybody. And I'm, I'm going to probably include you in that too, as it's because you're being a bit spineless. I, your man was kind of half fucking nearly half boisterous in that. I, you, you need to understand those fuckwits are benefiting nobody. nobody. The other people nobody. that pay for their tickets didn't come to see those pile of dickheads. And yeah, I did. Yeah. I went down there and I, I stood over him for five minutes and it was fairly violent. Now I went on. <laughs> but also there was, I think there was a lot of lockdown fucking fury in me too. Like, and it was, I was, um, I was venting. What did we? Get, oh, yeah. you know, I, I love, I love when someone gets there, come up as I had like, Oh yeah. Our, our friend, our friend Dan, he, we were walking down Grafton street, myself, Martin Maloney and Collie and, uh, Walking down, we were work, walking with Dan. There's two guards there standing outside an ATM, you know, across from McDonald's there. Yeah. And uh, they're just chatting away. And Dan couldn't help himself. He goes, working hard, lads. And uh, one of them turns around and they go, yeah, yeah, you fat cunt. He's <laughs> yeah. just like, perfect. <laughs> just, oh, fuck he, off. <laughs> you'd think, you think, he, you think he'd learn. He gets caught. So oh, he gets, gets called a Every every night out that we had, he could he got called a fat cunt, and is the most <laughs> perfect, apt, uh, brilliant, beautiful, beautiful. Just, like, and that's maybe he lied. I mean, he must have a fucking you, 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 mind you, you, you cannot you it. cannot be an asshole in life. It's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. I... <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom uh, we cannot let you go without um, giving a quick mention to you. how did you get on to the acting, like in Dame One Ivor and and a few other things. Yeah, you went I, from. From the yeah. comedian stage acting, how did you make that progression? It um, I saw a link between um, people. It was it basically? I, I said, well, I I had always had an interest in and comedic acting. I figured, well, sure, like yeah. one is the other, but um, I'd love to tell you, oh, sure, look at lads, it just you know, it just rolled in my door. It fucking well didn't. Like it, I made a conscious effort. And I went, well, who? This is two thousand and thirteen, two thousand and twelve. Who's well known? And why are they well known? Are they well known because they're that good? Because I'd open for some of these good comedians, like who were big names and stuff like that. Now, Tierna not included, like obviously, but I went, fuck me. I stayed that good. You know what I mean? They're not like blow my hair back. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. But they have <laughs> fantastic marketing. They are very good and stuff like that. But I thought, well, what is it? It's because they're on television. You must get your, you just have, there's no two ways about it. You must be well known. Yeah. You can be yeah. the best in the world, but if nobody knows about you, you're no use. Like, So you must be, you, mu- you do need to get, and, but it was, it did, the stars did align a small bit in that I knew one of the writers by pure fluke. We, I knew one of the writers on Demo and Ivor, but still, I mean, it was a closed shop and it was only on Republic Italian's time and it was kind of just YouTube and stuff. They had to even, they'd gotten a couple of, of, of clips on uh, Demo or on Republic Italy. Yeah. And then I, on a, a drinks night, it was, what's that? No, it was, it was an album launch. The demo was at demo of demo. And I, like, he's the same bloke, like, but does yeah. he brought out in character? He brought out this album. And uh, actually, yeah, he, there was a couple of songs from both characters on it. And it was all tongue and cheek silliness, but they actually had a proper album launch and everything like in, what was the name of the hotel? It was near where my, my girlfriend slash wife was. And she was working because she was running a nightclub at the time. And I had nothing to be doing. She's, would you come to drinks for the album launch? And I went, sure, look, this is the place to be. There'll be fellas from telly and stuff like that, possibly, who knows? But got met Andy, who plays both of them. And I just, for some reason, turned Southsider, South Dublin. I don't know what it was while he was the <laughs> character. I went, dude, you are absolutely making me want to fucking vomit right now. Are you Jim? <laughs> I feel like I need, I feel like I need a fucking tetanus shot just looking at you, right? And like that, he just started cracking up laughing. I started cracking up. He's, where are you from? I said, Tipperary. He goes, fuck off. Because he's all his father's family are from Tipperary. Like, and he does, uh, he speaks a lot of time with a tip accent when he's got drink on board. So we just tar- started chatting. Said, look, if you're around, it'd be great to maybe get you in the sketch or whatever. Said, loved it. Loved it. Following morning, somebody from RT rang. Half tick yeah. too, because they hadn't picked me. He had picked me. You know, that kind of way. Yes, they, yes. they were... It, they didn't like losing that kind of control, but they said, look, it's only for the sketches. It's not like it's a big money thing or whatever. And we made about five sketches for, for RT, for five or six. Mm-hmm. And then it got commissioned, but I had to audition for my own part again. And there was a load of lads went from Tarquin bit because I had no business. Tarquin was from fucking Fox Rock and I'm from fucking Tip, you know, 200 miles away. Like, 
and a lot of actual Tarquity blokes turned up at that day but there was no, <laughs> they were not getting my part like there was no way I turned up by the Heli Hansen jacket up collar and I remember there was yeah. and then what was sold it for because the director was actually in America at the time the guy who was filming something else he knew nothing about any of us he was just going with who he saw was best for the role based on the script and it was a part where you were you're being you're having your lines fed to you by just this girl sitting behind the desk and you're being filmed and one of the bits was um you were to be talking through a letterbox I, Tarkin was to be talking through a letterbox to Ivor and that was it so I'm guessing that the other 26 blokes just did that just talked like that but I went to a hardware shop and I bought a letterbox I pulled it out of my jacket and held it and talked through and just you can accentuate everything then with your eyes because your eyes are going dude are you in there <laughs> you're, you're and really? says, he says, as soon as you did that he said i didn't even fucking watch anymore he says and he says i didn't know that you had already played that character already in the sketches but then now there was a few pounds we put behind this and it was actually being made a tv show but again it was just going well how much do you want some really that was it was it the best nah way better fucking actors lads that are properly trained in acting down that corridor that day but how hungry of a fucker are you is really the question and that was it i was just yeah. I, like, I'd thrown everything at it if not if nothing else there wasn't like there wasn't I didn't need a script on the day and we were to have five big scenes there thereabouts learned but I wasn't bringing in the script I went if I'm gonna fuck, show that I'm committed I better know every bit of this and I remember in series two I got to work well series one I got to work with my hero which is uh, Rick Mail. but in series two I got to work nice. with Alan Ford who played Bricktop in Snatch yeah yeah and he went he, we were just sitting outside he goes how'd you get this fucking gig How'd you get this? And I told him the crack. He went, that's fucking funny you say that. Because when I went for the row, it was Bricktop. He had every single line. Every single line of the whole fucking show off. Every, wow. yeah. they, could, they could throw any part of the, of the movie at me. And I could give it back to him. And he's just based on, I, just, I didn't look the most vicious gangster. Do you know, with my big stupid glasses and stuff. He just, did, they just didn't. But because I had every bit of it learnt off. They could explore every bit of it with me, you know. So you're taking the guess now. Their hands, commitment, like. the commitment, yeah. the show, the, show the way the way he displays brick top was a vicious. Like the, the oh, way yeah. he used his 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 face in in that act it was amazing. Oh, horrible so, bastard! Horrible yeah, bastard! Be like, it's a uh, it's it shows though that like it, there's a running theme here where you've gotten success by being really committed to what you want, you know. Yeah, yeah. and like, hunger, a hunger. But if you have to think about it, like if you have to think, fuck, I need to be, but you, you, and you can take inspiration. I'm not, I don't know, was I always this hungry? I don't know. But it's like, I remember reading about, I remember reading Paul O'Connell, his book, and he was talking about like micro moments. Every, if you win just micro moments throughout the day, if all it is, is like, yeah, I leave that cup there down on the table, will I? You fucking want your lazy cunt, put it up and put it in the fuck and wash it, put it away, because that's yeah. a micro loss. Do you know what I mean? Get on, like, and you know, keep your, Keep your trousers fucking up all the time. Like, don't be just, don't be letting yourself slip. And it's, and I, every moment of every day, I've gone, like when Stephen texts me, go, do you want, I know it's the bank holiday weekend. No, fuck, there's no, there's no coming off the gas. When you're self employed, there's no coming off the gas. Like, there's no hoping yeah. that it fucking works itself yeah. out. Like, cause I, if I stop, I, I, I we all go hungry. <laughs> That's it. There's nobody coming here. Yeah, to yeah, you like yeah, if, you, yeah, if I stop, yeah, yeah. but it's not that, <laughs> like, it's, you have to just, if it feels like work, then you're in the wrong team. But this doesn't. Okay. That's why I was saying, like, I drove two, two or three days straight up and down to Belfast. And not a fuck, I didn't give a shit. It just, yeah. would you die? That's the only thing I could ever say to anybody is that you fucking just hunger. You need to be a hungry cunt nonstop. Like, and they eventually, whether you your face fits or not, which I know my face doesn't fit because I'm a white straight male. I don't fit in what is, you know what I mean? It's just, oh, we've had our time. No, I wasn't fucking there for it, but we've had our time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And right now, it's it's a different John. Like, there's other people from different, which you know, from minorities, and it's only right too. Like, and I haven't, I can fuck off. I don't like that. You know, yes. fuck off. Find something else to do if I if I'm gonna whinge about it. But they'll they'll get it gets to a point where the cream just has to rise to the top. If you just but keep banging, then something yeah. has to give. Like you but just if you, have, if you if you win deniability. Though. If you win, though, you you might get a lot of solid right winger lads that fucking follow you. You know, make fun. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, 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 I wouldn't. I the last thing I would do. That's why even my own podcast, like I, I don't have a team on it. Like you know yeah. what I mean? There, you know, I do. I just well, I'm I back. I back the crack that I like having the crack with people. 
And yeah, I yeah. hope that people rowing behind that because it's eventually, I mean, for the long game too. So I wouldn't dare go after the, the soft underbelly of jumping on Twitter at a certain time of the day or so, to attack somebody in the hope of get, garnering. I don't want them. I don't want that. I, I, I want about 500 people who are dedicated on a yearly basis of pay, buying a big ticket and coming to see me do a show. Because, yes. I mean, I think as Stuart Lee was saying, all you really need to live a really good life is about two and a half thousand people who fucking love you and would come to see you three, four times a year and you sell them a big ticket. And uh, you know what I mean? You're selling a, a 30 euro ticket and two and a half thousand yeah. people come to see you three or four times in a year. You're yeah, off to the yeah, fucking. Yeah. That's all you need. And that's all I would even if you, I, Even if you have a small following, you, you, need, you need them to be loud. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tom, before, before, before we let you go, um, any advice? I know you, you skirted on advice for people in, in the comedy game or, or on stage game. What's your nugget of advice for, for young people coming up and be, wanting to be comedians? Be sound and be on time. Those are two number one number one things. Two one. If you can have two number ones, I don't know. But <laughs> if we put them together under the same jumper, be sound and be on time. Nobody can fault you really after that. Just be sound yeah. and be on time. Don't turn up. Don't bitch, moan, and complain. Turn up early. Be on it early and do what they what, what they want of you. Don't get ridden, but do what is provided to make the show professional. Show the fuck up and get the fucking job done and be sound throughout. Because chances are you'll get booked just on your soundness for the longest time. And the more stage time you get, the better you'll get. So they will go hand in hand. If you stay sound and turn up on time, i.e. even before they ask you to show up, then... That's, I, uh, that's I actually probably... love the the be on time thing because it makes your life so much easier. It, it <laughs> like every part of your life becomes easier when you're early. And if you're early, you're on time. You have to be fucking there beforehand. It makes life. Yeah. So it, look, no, nobody's perfect, and stuff can go off the fucking rails. I'm sure. Look, we've. I'm still learning. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm turning turning the corner into forty. Like, and I feel like Jesus Christ. I feel learning wise. I'm. 18 there's that much to be learned about for conducting yourself like a proper fucking professional like and i remember hearing an interview with one of the driest men of all time but impressive in that he won a world cup it was clive woodward he'd coached uh the uk yeah, the, the english England. team in two, yeah. 2003 and they were a sack of shit the year before yeah. but i remember somebody asked me because he worked for xerox something very exciting prior to the, prior to being developed but i asked him so is it true that you've never ever been late in your entire existence, I mean, never. Come on, once, not once. Not as a child, not as a teenager, not my early, never. No matter what the circumstances, if I was, you know, hungover, fucking car crash, snowstorm, I've never, ever been late. That was kind of weirdly level of worry, you know, worrying level of fucking, <laughs> of, of inhumanity and that. Like, but. It's a great so, habit. You got a guy that had the personality of a fish that nobody could get on with, nobody really liked. But yeah. he had that level of dedication that he still yeah. tracked a bunch of fucking owl fellas at the time. You had fellas who were ready, you know, they yeah. were the fucking bin juice. Like these lads oh, yeah. were They're like, like Jason so Leonard the, with the belly hanging out in him there, you know, body fucked. Like, and Delalio was getting near the end as well. Oh, sure, full of cortisone, Delalio. Yeah, but yeah. these lads, what I'm saying is he managed based on his micro wins throughout the day every moment you must be conducting yourself like a professional same with joe schmidt i remember hearing that story of his first day on the job first or second day on the job and they were in carton house they were all terrified of him because they heard he was a bossy bastard they were in carton house but they're all flash they're all big big names they're all the ireland fucking team and next meeting he held up a key card to one of the rooms somebody's fucking bedroom he says now i know who's after losing this because i checked it at the desk i found it down below are you going to be man enough to stand up here and tell me you lost your key card? And sure, the pies are going, sure, I don't know who. And he named it, but Simon Zebo. He goes, oh, you fucking conduct yourself like that one more fucking time. And that's the last time you play for this team. What kind of a man doesn't fucking keep his own key? You know, he just... Sure, he, he just probably doesn't... gave it to some bird. But this is... She lost I'm, it. What I'm saying, <laughs> this is it. But the idea being is that he, like, and Zebo, that's why he was never going to fucking, you know, he was never yeah. going to blend with him because he's just an organic. Yeah. But... His attitude was, if I have to drag you all, look, I love a bit of cracklets, but I have to get bring you all on together and I can't risk these fucking little cracks in the day. Like, you know what I mean? But I don't think I'll ever be that level. But the two pieces of advice would be, be, be sound, be on time. Don't be a that's fucking pain in the hole. That's brilliant, time. Time. We, 
we've asked that question so many times to in not just comedians but uh different different um walks of life and that's the first time and that's a great piece of advice it's nice to get a different angle yeah it's it's and i'm not just waxing lyrical of it that's i've literally thought about that like literally yeah. what is the best piece of advice yeah. i could even give myself starting out oh yeah never be late especially when people are relying on you whatever be late for your own old fucking thing you know fair enough but if people i.e and there's a knock-on effect to audiences security people in the fucking work in the bar other people on the lineup don't you know the amount of times i mostly headline the shows i do but i'd yeah. normally be there before the first act goes on yeah. going, did you not want to rock it nope nope because i want you to know that i'm here and just like that night and go away joe Gla joe brand's or Joe Caulfield's Zoom shit the bed or internet shit the bed five minutes in. Had I been rocking in for when I was about to go on, then sure, there would have been a weird 15 minutes where they're going, uh, so we're just waiting on Tom there. You know, rather yeah. than me, you know, I'm just sitting there drinking tea out the back, grand. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's just, those, that's my top piece of advice. No, brilliant. brilliant. Well, actually, that, well, I'd love to give that piece of advice to one of our very talented and, and, and very, very funny <laughs> Funny dudes, uh, Mark Maloney. He's there's, the there's, to be honest, there's a few of them that can fucking take that. Advice. Well, that's true. That's true. I, and I know I was too. One time, look, I'm just, like I said, I probably only learned that in the last couple of years myself. Get it together, you know. Right. So, Tom, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you, and what is the future? Yeah, just follow things. If you probably best, I mean, you can follow me on any of your social platforms, of course. Tom O'Mahony Comedy will find it. But Buckshot being the name of my podcast, which, of course, Cowboys Kelly has been on as well. And Monday, Monday was on last week, I think. And I tied Hickey of the cork chap with the sketches, poking the poking the bear that is the, his loyalist or so what, whatever he was on last week. So if you, if you find Buckshot, you'll probably hear from the intro where what else is going on. As soon as things get back to normal, sure, I suppose we'll all hang out and slather pints over each other and roll around in a western mm -hmm. hay bale somewhere and the crack will be 90. Brilliant, Tom. And also we're going to have uh, you and, and French Joe's do a podcast on Buckshot as well in the near future. Whenever um, the two of you collide, it will be um, a beautiful thing. Tom, thanks very That'd much nice. for, for join, joining us tonight. Guys, thank you very much for watching and listening to the Dead Hedgehogs podcast with Tom. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I don't think I've ever laughed so much in, in my own podcast or a Dead Hedgehogs podcast. Uh, Tom, thanks for coming on. Thanks for watching. Pleasure. Please please subscribe, guys. Hit the red tab if you're on YouTube. And also, if you'd like to become a Patreon member, we have lots of extras coming up down the line there. We've already announced on our Patreon channel. Yeah. So I will encourage you to become a Patreon member. Yeah, become a Patreon member and get lots of cheeky goodies and maybe yes. a few bevins. Yes. Never know what's coming down the line. All right, Tom, thank you very much. Hello.